Welcome everybody. Welcome to our seventh lecture in the microcontroller course. And in this lecture we're going to study a bit about bits and actually some bits and pieces. Right, a bit. The word bit in computer language uh, refers to a binary digit. Binary digit bit. And uh, all computers, all modern computers, all digital computers, uh, rest very heavily for their operation on how the bits work. Now, for something to be rep represented by a bit, it must only have two possible states or values. So, uh, on and off, uh, right or dark, uh, light or darkness, uh, male or female, uh, and of course a zero and one, and true and false. Uh, maybe also in and out, and up and down. Anything that basically can have only two possible states or values. And uh, in microcontrollers, we represented any binary digit. We represent by either true or false, or one or zero. Uh, the maths of true and false was uh, developed by a mathematician called George Boole in 1847. And so the uh, algebra that we use, or the mathematics that we use to work with trues and falses, uh, is referred to as Boolean algebra. And uh, for that reason, uh, we refer to bits as Boolean objects. And uh, when we represent our Boolean objects in, in a uh, computer environment, uh, we just agree which one represents one and which one represents uh, zero. And uh, uh, often in the name itself, we include a hint as to which one we are referring to as one and uh, which one we're referring to as zero. For instance, we might call our variable heads or tails. And uh, then the first one would refer to one and the uh, second one would refer to zero. Heads, one, tails, zero, or whatever, depending on what we want to choose. Um, now, let me uh, um, antagonize all, uh, all female um, activists. Uh, are we going to refer to male as true or female as true? <laughs> or... Uh, let me antagonize all uh, LGBT, A, B, C, D, F, Gs. Uh, are there only two possible states in gender? And therefore, can we use gender as a binary digit? Anyway, those are just a little bit of a joke. Um, that's the principle of a bit. And uh, a single bit in our Arduino language and many others can be stored in a, a uh, variable type, bool or boolean, obviously named after George Bool. Now, we only don't only work with bits. In fact, computers very seldom make use of only single bits. Uh, it does happen, but uh, it's very seldom. More 
oftenly, more often, uh, they are put together, bits are put together to form a binary number. And a binary number is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, or whatever we want to represent. Now, uh, that might be a new concept, but it's actually just an old concept that we've uh, rechristened uh, into <laughs> a binary number. Now, you remember that uh, a decimal digit is any one of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's a decimal digit. Now, we very seldom just use these single numbers. We often string them together into something which we refer to as a decimal number. And, of course, we do that all day long, every day, um, when, we, <laughs> when we work with numbers. So, for instance, let's just see what we actually mean by a decimal number. Um, and, and, of course, this was a major breakthrough in uh, mathematics when we went from Roman numerals X, I, V, I, V, C, C, whatever, <laughs> um, to a decimal number which actually the places in that decimal number tell you how big the number is. So instead of 100 being C and 10 being X uh, in Roman numerals, uh, we put the decimal digit in a specific place to refer to a specific value. So for instance, the number 1754 uses decimal digits and uh, it makes up a, a decimal number. But what do we mean by this number? Well, we actually mean 1 times 1,000 plus 7 times 100 plus 5 times 10 plus 4 times 1. Now, <laughs> we know this all along, but uh, this is the way one can write it down. And uh, say so that number refers to the sum of all of these, these uh, numbers. And uh, we can actually write it uh, because we are talking about decimal and we have 10 fingers and 10 toes. Uh, we can write this in terms of tens. So we can say 1754 is 1 times 10 to the 3 plus 7 times 10 to the 2 right, that's a 1,000, that's 110 squared, plus 5 times 10 to the 1. And what happens after 1? Well, naught happens after 1, so we, <laughs> we'd have to write this 4 times 10 to the naught, and anything to the 0th power is 1. But that's a discussion for another day. So, this we're very used to, and uh, if we now convert this into binary, and in binary, instead of being able to represent all the numbers up to 10 in decimal, in binary, we can only represent the numbers 0 and 1. Two numbers, like bicycle, two wheels. Binary is two different numbers, and uh, we could use <laughs> A, B, A, B, A, A, B, B, whatever, but... Uh, we typically use 0 and 1. So here we have a binary number. I've left a little space in the middle there so it's easier to read. And uh, we have 0, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And in exactly the same way, analogous to the, the previous one, this is equal to the number 1 times 2 to the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1 times 2 to the 7 plus 0 times 2 to the 6 plus 1 times 2 to the 5 plus 1 times 2 to the 4. Right, I'm busy going down the number here. Plus 0 times 2 to the 3 plus 1 times 2 to the 2 plus 0 times 2 to the 1 plus 0 times 2 to the 0. And, uh, well... 
it's lots easier to write it down like that. And and to get back to our the numbers that we are more used to instead of these exponents, 2 to the 7, 2 to the 6, if you take 2 and multiply it by itself 7 times, you get 128. So this is 1 times 128 plus 0 times 64 plus 1 times 32 plus 1 times 16 plus 0 times 8 times 1 plus 1 times 4 plus 0 times 2 plus 0 times 1. And so that is a binary number. And we write it down like that. And yes, you can't just look at that and say, whoops, that is unless you some other savant. But uh, if you remember, this is what it is. And you know the seventh digit is always 128. That is easy. 1 times 128, skip 1, 1 times 32, 1 times 16, none times, none, none times 8, 1 times 4, none times 2, none times 1. And that gives us the value of this decimal number. And so, we now ask ourselves the question, if 8 bits make a byte, what, are, what do we call half a byte? Well, never be told or believe that uh, computer programmers don't have a sense of humor. They have a very well-developed sense of humor and uh, one bumps into it every now and again, and this is one of them. Half a byte makes a nibble. And seeing that byte is, is spelt with a Y, this nibble is spelt with a Y as well. Half a byte is a nibble. Right, and so we can actually break, to make things easier, we can break binary numbers up into nibbles. And we only have four to work with. So 0010, zero, 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 first four, 1101, one, one, second four, 0101, zero, one, one, the third four. Okay? So we can represent that number by looking at three different nibbles. Okay? And we can now translate using this binary table. Uh, zero, zero, that's zero, one, two, two times two plus zero, two, three, four, five, all the way up, right? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, one times eight, one times seven, I'm sorry, one times eight plus one times four plus one times two plus one times one gives us 15, right? So we now can translate this over here into 2, 13, there's 1101, and 5. Okay? So we have shortened this rather horrible number into 235. Okay? But are we asking for trouble if we use 13 here? Because we will not know whether it's a nibble for 1 and a nibble for 3 or the nibble for 13. That's going to cause us a bit of... of uh, we can see in the future, definitely, this is going to cause confusion. So, we need to find something for a 10. That's not 1 and 0, 1, 10 and 0. We need to find a symbol that we represent 10 by. And we just, by convention, jump to the alphabet. So 10 is A, 11 is B, 12 is C, 13 is D, 14 is E, and 15 is F. Right? So we've just, just like we've got 0 to 9, we have now a symbol for 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So, instead of writing 13 here, we can now write D. Okay, that was the 13 one there. And so this number 
in binary. This is we write how we write binary in Arduino code, Arduino sketches. This number in binary is just the number 2D5. And yes, we can immediately guess that this is hexadecimal because we have a D there, but sometimes we don't have a, an alphabet character. We could have 111 being a nibble of one, a nibble of one, and a nibble of one. So what we do is, is like we call this binary, 0B and that number, so we call this hexadecimal, 0X, 2D5. Okay, and we can write this down much quicker by saying we actually had the base 16, hence hexadecimal. So we are using the base 16 instead of the base 10 because we have 16 different symbols. And so this number again becomes much easier to represent as 2 times 16 squared, it's in that third place there, plus 13, that's D, 13 times 16 to the 1 power, which is 16, plus 5 to the 16 to the 0th power, which is just 1, so it is 2 times 16 squared, so 2 times 256, plus 13 times 16, plus 5 times 1. And so that is a much shorter way of representing this binary number by three hexadecimal digits, each one referring to the value of the nibble that it comes from. First nibble, second nibble, third nibble. Right. So now we're going to learn how to work with bits. Uh, any computer, digital computer, which can't work with the bits that it has in its memory um, is just not a computer. It's a memory. <laughs> so let's, let's learn how to work with these bits because sooner or later we're going to be doing something like that. So um, what, what did uh, George Boole uh, teach us or tell us. Um, okay, uh, he said, if you work with things that are true and false, there's some rules that we accept as axiomatic in our society, and uh, and that's that's how it all, all gets put together. So uh, let's let's take two. Uh, four statements, right? Uh, the first statement, dogs love cats. Okay? That's false. Uh, we assume that we actually mean all dogs love cats because maybe one or two do. But uh, dogs love cats, false. Pigs can fly in the middle of July, false. Um, roses are red, true. Violets are blue, true. Sugar is sweet and so are you, true. So uh, <laughs> uh, that was an old uh, ditty we used to say as, as children. Uh, so, okay, we've, we've got these statements and we're now going to play with them and uh, see how the Boolean, uh, the Boolean operators and or, and exclusive or, um, how they how they work and it's 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 all very logical. Uh, let's start with the first one. If I say uh, dogs love cats, that's that's the false one, and pigs can fly. Okay, uh, is that true? No, right? That's false. What if I say roses are red? That's true, and Pigs can fly. No. Even though roses are red, pigs can't fly. So the answer of that is false. Maybe uh, uh, dogs love cats and violets are blue. No. That's, that's also false. 
but roses are red and violets are blue, that is a true statement because both of those are true, right? So that's how the AND operator works. Now let's look at the next one. Uh, dogs love cats or pigs can fly. Well, neither is true, so that's false. But roses are red or pigs can fly. Well, yes, even though pigs can't fly, roses are red is true, so that answer is true. That or that is true. Uh, dogs love cats or roses are red. Yes, because roses are red, that's true. Roses are red or violets are blue. Yes, both of them happen to be true. So that is true. And now we come to something a little bit new. Uh, and uh, we refer to it as an exclusive or. And uh, what exclusive means is if I say this or that and both of them are true, then exclusive or is false. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, dogs love cats, exclusive or, pigs can fly. Well, yes, that's false because either of those are not true, so that is false. Uh, roses are red or dogs love cats. Yes, that's true because roses are red. Uh, pigs can fly or exclusive or. And up to here, exclusive or is exactly the same as or. Um, pigs can fly or roses are red. Yes, it's true because roses are red. But now here's the one difference. What if they're both true? Roses are red exclusively or violets are blue. So we say, are they exclusively true? In other words, one is true, the other not, the one is true, the other not. No, that is not true. So that's the answer to that is false. Okay, so uh, this is relatively intuitive. It's just that we're putting some names and, and numbers to it. And uh, we can even put our binary numbers to it. And that's exactly what I've said up there, but in terms of binary. Zero and zero is zero. One and zero is zero. Both of them are not one. Zero and one is still zero. Both of them are not one. One and one is one, yes. Uh, because both of them are one, so that one's one. Zero or zero is zero. Yes, <laughs> both of them are zero. One or zero is one. Yes, because that one's one. That or that. That or that. Yes, that one's one, so that's one. That or that. Yes, that one's one. And these are the same and exclusive all, but if that one is one, exclusive all that one is one, then the answer is zero. Right. And so that's how we work with bits one by one. And when we get a variable that's made up of a binary number, then we just do exactly the same, but in the column. What is that binary number and that binary number? Well, look at these values. 0 and 1, no, that's 0. 0 and 0, 0. 1 and 1, yes, that's 1. 0 and 0 is 0. 1 and 0, no. 1 and 1, yes. 0 and 0, no. They both 0, so the answer is 0. 1 and 1, yes, that's 1. So we just do that bitwise. And uh, or, same thing. Is 0 or 1 equal to 1? Yes. Is 0 or 0 equal to 1? No. Is 1 and 1 equal? Are they both 1s? Yes. So that's 1. 0 or 
sorry, 1 or 1, yes, the answer is 1. 0 or 0, they still 0, and so on. Uh, and then if we go to the exclusive or, a couple of places where it's now changed, there where it's 1 and uh, 1 or 1, the answer is yes, 1 or 1 is true if both of them are 1. But exclusive or 1 exclusive or, that's a sign, 1 exclusive or 1 is 0, 1 exclusive or 1 is 0, 1 exclusive or 1 is 0. Otherwise, things are the same as the or. Okay, now let's have a look at some functions which are built into the Arduino to make life easier for you. Uh, theoretically, you could do all of these by hand, but uh, it, they, really, it, they really help to do bit functions much quicker. So um, let's have a look at them. We start off with bit and brackets n. n is the number of the bit in all of these functions. And the number is, it starts with the, the least significant bit, or the LSB, which is just like we do in decimal, the one completely on the right. Okay, so that one is the first one that you count, and that is bit number zero. Okay, bit number one is the next one. Bit number two is the next one. So the value of bit number zero, in other words, if we have a zero in that, by that n, the, the value, the, the place value of bit number zero is one. The place value of bit number one is two. In other words, two to the one. The place value of bit number three is, uh, uh, bit number two is two squared. That's 4. Place value of bit number 3 is 8. And so forth and so on. And uh, this sounds very trivial, but um, you try and calculate quickly in your head the value of bit number 31, which is completely valid. You can ask for the value of bit number 31, and uh, of the Arduino will tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> So this is handy, especially when you get the big numbers. Now we have bit clear and bit set. In both cases, n is again the bit number starting at zero and going all the way up, as many as bits you have in your number. So if you have a, a char, remember that was eight bits long. So you have bits from 0 to 7. A, an integer is um, 16 bits long, so we have bit number 0 to bit number 15, and so forth. So we can now clear, which is a, a uh, term for make a 0, or set, which is a term for make it 1 any bit in a specific variable. So if I want to have that variable, and the variable is 321 or something like that, and I want to make sure that the fifth bit is zero, whatever it is now, I just want it to be zero. Then I can run bit clear, whatever my variable name is, and whatever the uh, the value of the the number of the bit same thing for set right um, then we have bit read which is once more we have a variable and we have a bit number and we want to ask what is that value and so i can say bit read of uh, test uh, and I want the fifth bit. And if the fifth bit is zero, this answer will be zero. And if the fifth bit is one, this answer will be one. Okay? 
similarly, but not quite the same, we can write a bit. We can say, here's my variable, and that's the bit number I want to access, and I can put then a zero there, in which case it will set it to zero, or a one there, in which case it will set it to one. So you can already see that actually this one is a combination of these two, right? If I have a zero in the third position, it's a bit clear. And if I have a one in the, bit, in the third position here in the, the list, then it's the same as bit set. Then sometimes, especially in the case of integers, our, our integers are two bytes long. They're 16 bits long, which is two eight bytes. And so we have a, a way of saying, don't worry about the top four by uh, the top eight bits. I just want the bottom eight bits. And the answer to that will be to this function will be that the low the lower eight bits. Or maybe I want the top eight bits, the most significant bits of the most significant byte. MSB. Uh, it's used for bit and byte because it, they both are B and the context tells you which one we're talking about. But we now want to know the top eight bits in our variable and then we just use this function high byte. And then this one's a little bit more complicated so don't worry if you don't follow this immediately. But what if you have something coming in from some other world? <laughs> a signal coming in, high, low, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, something like a serial, a serial uh, communication. Uh, but you want to actually shift that value into a variable. Then we can use this, this um, uh, uh, function, we can use it to do that. We can make a variable equal to uh, this this function. And we say our variable, let's call it var or whatever, is equal to. Then I give it a pin which is going up and down. Okay? Uh, that's the one I want to read. Then I give it a number of a pin, that's a number of a pin, a number of a pin, which is a clock. In other words, a clock just goes tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. And on each tick, it will read the value of that data pin. And then tock is just so that it, <laughs> you know that the tick is finished. And then tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Or zero one zero one zero one zero one. Okay? And then we want to know which way we must shift these this data in. We can start at the most significant bit first, or we can start with the least significant bit first. So if we write that there as the third, uh, the third parameter, then it'll start and put these bits as they come in, put them from the, the, the top one down. And if we say LSB first, then it'll put them from the bottom up. Okay? And then we have a very similar, uh, similar uh, function, except that this doesn't return a value which you can store in a variable. This is given a variable what we, we must shift out using this data pin, using this clock pin, and which way we're going to shift it out. Okay, so there we have some of our bit functions. And while we are these extra functions, or the bit functions, uh, what about some bits and pieces? These are the extra functions that are kind of lying around. 
which uh, I'm just going to uh, mention briefly because their meaning is relatively simple to understand. Um, if I take a character, char, a character variable, and I say, is alpha whatever that variable is, then it will come back with a true or false. And if that's alpha, and alpha means alphabetical, right? So if this is alphabetical, this character, then come back true. Otherwise, false. Okay? And then it's twin sister. Is this alphabetical or numeric? So 0 to 9 or A to Z. And there we put our variable, our, our char variable, our character variable. And we ask, is this alphanumeric? And the answer is yes, if it's 0 to 9 and A to Z, or A to Z, and uh, false if it's not. Then, is this a digit? Okay, so is this a, a value from 0 to 9? Yes or no, true or false. Is this hexadecimal? Ah, okay. So now we allow 0 to 9 and or, or A to F. Is, is this a hexadecimal digit? And you remember hexadecimal by 16 had the number 0 to 9 and then A, B, C, D, E, F. We test to see this whether this variable that we've given it is hexadecimal or not. Is this lowercase? Ah, oh, that's easy. And is this uppercase? Once more, true or false, depending on what value you give it. Is this a space? Okay, fine, that's easy. But its twin sister is interesting. Is this white space? Now, white space is a term which we use for everything that kind of doesn't print on the screen. Okay? Uh, and so, white space is a space or a carriage return. Okay? Uh, like for the old typewriter, uh, the, the, the carriage return that you grab the handle on the right and push it to the left and you start a new, a new, uh, a new line on your page. And then also, part of white space is a line feed. Okay? So either a space or a carriage return or a line feed. That's white space. Then is this ASCII? Okay? Now ASCII is American Standard Interface for something else, I. And uh, it's, it's the, the set of characters which we use every day. They've each, they're each given a number up to 127. But after that, all of the characters we have are not ASCII anymore. They're not in the standard ASCII table. And so this is basically asking, is this number between zero, is this character, the number associated with this character, is this between zero and 127? Then we have is this a punctuation mark? That's handy. So anything, a comma, a full stop, a quote, whatever, uh, will return yes if it's punctuation, no if it's not. Is this printable? Okay, sometimes you want to uh, uh, print, print something and there might be funny characters in there that will look funny on the screen. You can just check before you print it whether that character is printable. In other words, it's something that will come up on the screen. Then, is this a control character? Okay, so a control character is an escape character or a tab character or whatever. Okay, so is this a control character? And then lastly, is this a 
graphical character. Is there anything that will print on the screen with this number of character? So you, you sometimes don't want the person to be confused when he sees a blank space on the screen. It might not be a space character or a white space character. It might be a character for which there's no definition of what that character is. And you, if you're not in Chinese uh, character set, then you don't want all these funny Chinese characters to come up. So you can check whether it's a graphical character or not. A lot of these you never use, but some are very handy. Okay, let's look at some maths functions, just while we're looking at these bits and pieces. Um, firstly, random. Random returns a number between 0 and 1 uh, whenever you call it. So you can say x equals random. Okay? And so that means x will be a floating point number between 0 and and one. And that's very handy. Except for one problem, these are actually pseudo random numbers, which means that even though they are random, they are very random, but when you switch on your Arduino, it will come up with the first random number. And when you switch it on tomorrow, it will come up with the same first random number and so forth on. In other words, the list of random numbers is the same every time straight after you've switched on the Arduino. Now, if you really want a random number, you don't want that. You don't want the, uh, the guy who gets um, uh, the lotto by, uh, by a random number. You don't want him to see what the random first random number was last time and it's going to be the same this time. You want it to be completely random. And so you use this other function which is called random seed. And you feed this with any number in there. And that, that then is a random number. And typically you can use, you can put in there the number of milliseconds since the Arduino has been switched on. And yes, that starts at zero, but wow, uh, you have to be very accurate <laughs> to actually get that number uh, to, uh, to be exactly the same as last time because if there are thousands of them going by every second. And uh, if you want it even more random, put in the number of microseconds since you switched on the Arduino. And um, other people put different numbers, today's date, uh, and so forth. A number that you sure will be different every day, and therefore the random number, this random number, will be different every time you run the program. Of course, if you leave out random seed, it's very handy because then your list of random numbers will be the same each time, and you can actually test your program with the same set of random numbers. But uh, put in one random seed, and you only need to do this once, right at the beginning. After that, everything's random. Put in a random seed if you really want random numbers. Then, minimum and maximum. Very handy. You feed minimum with two numbers and it will come out the value that, that it will feed into your variable x equals min of a and b. Whichever one is smaller, that will be the value, new value of x. x equals max two numbers and typically variables. Then you can, it will come back with that variable, uh, the value of that variable. Then the square root, in other words, given a number, 16. 
What's the square root of 16? Well, what's the number when multiplied by itself gives me 16? The answer is 4, etc., etc. Uh, and also, this, the square of a number. So, if I put in here square of 6, it'll give me 36. It just ha is handy to have that available uh, when you're doing mathematics. Then, absolute value, right? Absolute value is a fancy name of saying nothing negative, right? If it's negative, just make it the same number, but positive, okay? So the absolute value is the value of the number, if it's if the number is positive, give the same number. If the number is negative, just return with the positive equivalent of that number. And then constraint is, is very handy. Uh, if I put a number in here and I put the lower bound and the upper bound, then if this number is in between those two, fine, then it comes back with that number. But if the number is lower than that number, then you come back with a lower number. You've constrained it not to go below that number. And if the number f is larger than that number, it comes back with upper. In other words, you've constrained it to be somewhere between lower and upper. If it's below lower, it comes back with lower. If it's above upper, it comes back with upper. Then, power, uh, take this to the power, uh, and I've written this incorrectly, this should be power f comma n, which in other words takes that number and, and takes it to the power of n. Okay, I'll change that in the, uh, in the, the presentation. Uh, and then, this is another handy one, map a number, which is somewhere between the lower and the upper limit, this lower and upper limit. And map it to be somewhere between this lower and this upper limit. Let me give you an example. Let's say lower limit is 0 and upper limit is 10. Okay? And capital lower limit is 0, and upper limit is 100. Okay? Then, if we feed this number with 5, feed this function with 5, 5's between 0 and 10, it will come back with the value 50, because that's the same distance from 0 to 100, halfway, right? If we feed this with 2, it'll come back with 20, and so forth. And uh, a very interesting thing is, these don't have to be smaller and bigger. These can be from a big number to a small number, or a negative number to a positive number, etc., etc., etc. Very handy function. And then if you know anything about trigonometry, you'll want to use these sooner or later. Okay? Fine. So, those are some maths functions. Now, there are a couple of time functions as well. The delay function, we've used a lot already. Delay by this number of thousandths of a second, in other words, milliseconds. But there is another one, if you really want short delays. Delay by this number of microseconds, in other words, millionths of a second. So you can have a delay for a couple of millionths of a second, as best it can. Obviously, it might have problems in delaying too accurately, uh, but uh, it will try, and it'll give you the best it can. And then, these I mentioned, I mentioned briefly, uh, earlier when we talked about random, this one returns with the number of milliseconds since the Arduino was switched on. 
and I think it rolls around off to three weeks or something like that. So this one gives you the number of milliseconds since the, uh, the Arduino was switched on, and this one gives you the number of microseconds since the Arduino switched on. And obviously it rolls around uh, much, in a much shorter time. Right, and all of these I've, I've handled in a very brief way. Um, I might even made, have made a slip or two here or there. Um, but never fear, if you have any question with regards to these functions, and with regards to the entire Arduino, <laughs> Arduino language, just open up this page, Arduino.cc, reference, English, EN for English. And uh, there are, there's a clickable um, list of all the functions and how they work and uh, examples of each, etc., etc. Very powerful. With, it, with that, you actually don't need me. But sometimes their description might be a bit obtuse. Of course, thinking of it, sometimes my description might also be obtuse. And right, now we go to some music functions, what I call music functions. <laughs> so um, we can do some music on the Arduino, nothing like Johann synthesizers. But uh, nevertheless, nice, fee nice feedback. Uh, there's a function called tone. You tell it what pin it must make the tone on and the frequency that it, uh, that it does it at. Um, and it will make, make that sound uh, as long as you don't turn it off. It will just keep on making that sound. Um, frequency is, is cycles per second, hertz. And so if you put in a thousand there, you'll get round about and uh, that's it. Then you do have the option of not only giving the pin and the frequency, but also the length that that sound must be made. And uh, remember that you can tell it exactly how long it's going to be. So you could actually start uh, some tones uh, on, on various pins and uh, switch them off at various times. Uh, it's just uh, interesting. And uh, that way we could have polyphonic music. And then that's how you switch off the sound if you want to. And uh, you just say no tone and the pin, and it will stop making the sound on that pin. Then we have uh, four nice little functions to measure the p a pulse coming in, which isn't quite music, but uh, it could be, for instance, a, uh, a set of musical uh, waves coming in that have been clipped and, and made into pulses. But um, this, this will pick up any pulse that enters at that pin. So you tell it what pin you must do it at. And then you say either high or low. I must measure the, the pulse while it's high or I must measure the pulse while it's low. Uh, some pulses go high and then go low and then they're finished. Other pulses go low and then back high and then they're finished. So you choose which one you want. And uh, sometimes the pulse isn't coming, uh, something's wrong, and uh, you don't want the, the computer to sit there and, or the, the uh, Arduino, to sit there and just uh, twiddle its thumbs and you can't work out why nothing's happening. So you can say, I must wait at, le uh, at least uh, of a maximum of so many microseconds uh, before the pulse starts. If the pulse hasn't started by then, come back with zero and uh, report that that's nothing's happened. So um, 
you can do that. And then if you want a very long pulse, uh, this function is not as accurate, but it can handle much longer pulses. And uh, so if you have a long pulse, rather use that one, the pin and whether it's a high or low pulse. And also you can give it the maximum number of microseconds that it will uh, uh, wait before the pulse comes, before it gives up. That ends up all of our extra um, functions, our uh, bits and pieces. And I'd now like to give you some homework. And uh, this is our first uh, project that um, some of the, the large the large bag, bag of tricks people might want to make a permanent one for their grandchildren to play with. Um, and this is a game which I've devised um, called Fastest Draw in the West. And uh, to, to do this, you need to, for homework, put together your breadboard and now you know how to do things. So this is just schematic. You put together your breadboard in this way. You connect D2 to a switch and then as we've done before the switch goes to ground right so that the switch pulls this pin down and of course you are going to select that pin uh, or uh, mode digital mode we're going to make that input pull up okay that's just a tip. But we're going to be writing this program together next week. Uh, your homework is just to put this together. A switch connected to D2. A switch connected to D3. An LED with its accompanying resistor connected to D12. Another one with its resistor to D11 and another one with its resistor to D10, okay? And then to D6, your little mylar speaker, which you'll find in your box of tricks, with a limiting resistor, because this one's resistance is quite low. We don't want to short circuit that pin. So with our limiting resistor, our mylar speaker, and we're going to have a lot of fun putting together this specific game. We're now going to use what we've learned so far. Thank you so much. See you next week.